you know, in the back of your mind, you get these echoes of thoughts. They start creeping up on you, and you sort of arrive at a point, and it completely changes your life. Something that sort of haunts you for weeks on end, and suddenly you go, ah, that's it. Unconscious, unconscious thinking. It's important stuff. <laughs> I am pretty nomadic. I like it. I really don't feel comfortable in one place for too long. I really like to move around. What do they say? It's the traveling, not arriving. I'm like that. It's a big world, and I'm very, very lucky to be able to go and see it. That's one of my greatest pleasures. In some ways, yeah, I can see the ideal of being in one place, and I guess. Eventually, I will do that, but I really can't honestly say I can think of one place I want to stop and stay at the moment. Have you been conscious of who you are the whole of these ten years? Have you actually worked on something? <sighs> It's a really good question, but I'm still trying to figure it out. To be honest, I think you're definitely a creation of what. A lot of people want to make you, and it's very hard to stop that. Obviously, they're not making something out of thin air. If I am what they say I am, it's happened pretty naturally. I'm not the sort of person who choreographs too much in my life. I only like fate. Take it and wander around the neighbourhood at night, being amazed, saying poems to each other. By this stage, Acid was not hallucinatory anymore, but I remember he got some that was, and we only took half each. And it was like watching a curtain of transcendental lighting come down from the ceiling, and it just obscured Michael, lifetime, everything. Twelve hours later. And there's Michael in the corner with enormous eyes, white, scary, scary white. I never wanted to do anything like that again. But I think he quite enjoyed that feeling of no responsibility for the self. Michael just had all this other capacity in him, which is why he was so charismatic and charming. His interest was wide and deep. He had capacity for things that he never really finished doing. I always felt he had it in him to be a very good actor, one of those transparent sort of ones, where you can see their hearts. And I often, over the years, wondered whether he'd managed to keep any of that purity for himself. He was a very generous and open person, interested in people, generous feelings towards people who were suffering. He got it about the gender thing. Seeing that as little kids, that there was like Spanish kids and black kids and white kids all playing around in the front garden somewhere, and thinking as the years go by, what are they going to learn? Are they going to be able to still play together? There was a song about that, about kids. What do they learn? They learn by watching. It was definitely a, a racially harmonious song. I will chink my glass to Australia's future, but not so much to its past. I think you know Western exuberance to colonise and to knock things down and build things up. We set an entire culture underneath the carpet for 200 years. It's just been decimated. Very special, delicate, beautiful culture. 
And I think the best thing about the bicentenary is that all these issues have been raised and something is going to be done about it, at least to help Aboriginals retain what they have. It's just an angry song. Injustices. The world spent about a million dollars a minute last year on arms. It's like an imbalance in nature to me. Very dangerous. There's a currency of hate that you can feel in Europe with rise of fascism and neo-Nazis, religious wars. We cannot forget, not so much in the romantic sense at all, but in the universal sense, we cannot forget the power of love. That's a gift. century. Big change of ahead, that's what I feel. I think we have to give up the idea of ideal futures. The world is moving too quickly for some sort of perfect world, but I think we're definitely coming to grips with what the world is, how it works, and it's a strange time for everyone to bear that in a way on their shoulders. We never had so much information before and now we all have to know what's going on. It's a time of great change and hopefully we'll be able to deal with it and make it as good as possible. So I asked in France, I mean seriously on a big radio station live, if a flying saucer came down, would I go away with them and have babies? And it was really seriously asked. <laughs> Yeah, I would. Definitely. Once in a lifetime chance, sure. I wish it was attractive. Thanks very much, Ethan. Uh, as you can see, everybody, I'm somewhere over Melbourne, heading off to the next uh, concert on a tour. Um, all I've got left for you tonight is number one. On take 40 is the Three Stooges with all the love. Good night, Australia. See you soon. Thanks. I swing between being extremely positive and confident to being absolutely in despair about things, to be honest. I don't know if I could have done it by myself. Definitely not. Having six people, each one making up for the other when one was lacking in that belief, you know, that's how we got there, really. <laughs> 